Okay, so we're at the last session, last speech of the day, last talk of the day. I'm happy to introduce Michael Gibskov. Michael, can you come, please come in? Michael, you want to come? <laughs> so Michael is now at the Department of Biological Science in Purdue University. He has done lots of things. I mean, he started work I think in sequence analysis by, I mean, creating the sequence profile, I mean, which are used now everywhere with the famous paper from uh, him and David Eisenberg. He has been involved in a lot of algorithmic development around sequence search. He works on evolution of protein kinase and phosphatase, among other things. He's also president of the International Society for Computational Biology, which I think is quite relevant as I mean, ISMB meetings are organized, I mean, through uh, ICSCB, so that's quite relevant here. As geographical links, I put Corvallis, Oregon, where I think you studied, and University of, uh, sorry, of Wisconsin in Madison, then of course the Supercomputing Center in San Diego, where you were for quite a long time, and now Purdue University. And as biolinks, I put David Eisenberg, which I already mentioned, Roland Luthi, Phil Bourne, Timothy Bailey, Christina Zhang, and John Devereux and Anna Robinson. John Devereux, in fact, I will take 10 seconds maybe to say something because we haven't mentioned his name at all during this conference. And if there is somebody which has been very instrumental in getting good software out to the software to the user community, that's one of the, I would say, two or three people uh, which we are really instrumental in that. So there is Roger Staden in England and John Dever in the US. And for all of those which have used a GCG package, probably some of you were not even born when this package was there, but GCG was for so much, so long, I mean, it's a uh, poor horse of everyone working on, uh, at that time, big computer. Of course, we were not at Teraflops, something like that, but VAX or I mean, anything of that type. So, I mean, uh, of course, John Dever was trying to get software for his package, and one of software package he, he, he put inside the GCG program was the profile tools from Michael. And so last person in Anna Robinson, who worked, I mean, briefly with Michael before becoming his wife. And I think I was instrumental in some meeting because uh, the meeting took place in Intigenetics. Nada Robinson was product manager of PC Gene, and she was asked to be also product manager, I mean, to I mean, to field test sequence analysis software, I mean, sorry, sequence search software. And then, I mean, the so president of Intelligenetic asked me for a list of names of people which could be, sir, I mean, uh, uh, consultant, and I've put in the name of list Michael Gripskov. Michael was selected and he started working with Nina, and the rest is history. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, I was always, in fact, I only today found out because I always thought also that your name is Russian, in fact, you know. <laughs> and I found out on your page that you say, no, it's not Russian, it's Danish. And I hear Christian being very happy to know about it. Oh, he knew about it, okay. <laughs> he knew about it. <laughs> so I thought, I mean, as I found that today, I mean, I would add it. And uh, so that it's a town near Hill Road where your grand grandfather immigrated in the US. So then, the last thing is Michael was speaking about this drawing which he used a lot during courses, and I will let him maybe say what he wanted to say about his drawing. I mean, before we open his talk. Well, I guess all I wanted to say was. Um, I owe a lot to Brigitte for this drawing because every year when we introduce to students how you find motifs in proteins, I always show them this drawing uh, after we talk about multiple alignments. They all, it always immediately makes them understand how far you can go and how you can make big mistakes. So I think it's always been the perfect drawing about motifs. So that's part of a series of six or seven drawings that Brigitte Buckman made when we open up Expasi, and those are still on Expasi. If you go to ProSat page, there is a link to this uh, graphic. So they're hidden a bit. It's like a, a Easter egg. So it's five or six of those drawings which are hidden on Expasi. I mean, not hidden completely. So you have links, normal links, but people generally don't see them because they're not prominent. Okay, thank you, Michael, for being here. Thank you. 
história, né? So because I'm the last speaker, I, I clearly can speak as long as I like. So, so uh, <laughs> I don't think I'll go through all the slides I've got, but I, I do have to, uh, well, I, I very much appreciate being here. There's many people here that I haven't seen for a long time, and it really recalls for me the days, you know, of 1985 when, when things were much different. And I don't think people appreciate how much different it was in 1985. So in 1985, when you know a large number of sequences in a database was several thousand, and uh, the sequence database projects were basically on the ropes because they could not deal with the huge volume of sequences they were getting, several thousands per year. So with that sort of as the situation, I first met Amos, I think, at a Waterville Valley meeting. and. Um, you know, he'd been doing the uh, Swiss Pro for a while, and uh, he'd, uh, the, the, in those days I worked on bacterial sigma factors, because that's what I'd done my, my thesis on. And uh, so there was some bacterial sigma factors, they'd just been sequenced, they were in Swiss Pro, and there was something I didn't like about the description of the sigma factors. So I so, saw so Amos was at this meeting, and I went and talked to him, and he was sitting there, and I said, well, I have some problems with the annotation on this, and you should really change it. He says, oh, one second. And he gets out his computer and he does some things and, and he says, okay, so what, what should it say? And I say, well, it should say something like this and this. And it goes, type, 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 type. And so I says, okay, anything else? I say, no, that, that's about it. And then he, he, he kind of looked at me and I, I okay, so I, I said, well, so when will this be changed? Because when you change something in any of the other databases, you sent them a mail and they thought about it and it took a week or two weeks or two months or six months or a year. He says, oh, it's already changed. I changed it. That, that's Swiss Pro in my computer. So I think it initiated an entirely different way of dealing with the people that, that use the data as uh, important as opposed to the database people themselves being the important people. So I think that's always been the great thing about uh, Swiss Pro. Um, I did wonder exactly why I was invited. So actually I thought I racked my brain and I eventually decided that um, the reason was in the early days of Swiss Pro, the names were four letters, dollar sign, five letters. And so when, when that when that came out, uh, every, a lot of us a lot of us in those days used VAX computers. Nobody uses VAX computers now, but in VAX computers, the dollar sign is a reserved character for introducing commands on the VAX computer. So I wrote to Amos, and I said, choosing dollar sign in the name is very bad because you can't use it on the VAX. So he, this took more than a day, a little more than a day, but about a week or so later, he wrote back and he said, okay. I change it to underline. I think that's how the underline came, but I'm sure I'm not the only one who made that comment, but uh, that, was, that was my only claim to fame, really, in Swiss Pro. So anyway, um, well, let me go on with my, uh, my actual scientific talk. Um, oh, there's one more thing I have to say, I guess, about Amos. Every, we all thought when Amos started out, the, the, all the sequence databases were having huge problems dealing with thousands of sequences. And we thought Amos was entirely crazy. Just one guy, he would sit down and he would do the sequence database all by himself. The same thing that was defeating much larger groups of other people. It was an obviously crazy thing to do. But we were all wrong. And Amos was right. And so this is what I tell to my students now, is that uh, you should not refuse to do the problem just because it's obviously impossible. If it's an important problem, you should do it anyway. And if it's really important, people will come in and help you along the way. So uh, Amos, I think, is the, for especially for computational students who don't learn about doing very tedious lab experiments, is the, the best example of 
hard work pays off, even if it's obviously impossible. So. All right, so let me go on. So I think it, it takes a lot of hubris, I think, actually to talk about evolution of protein kinases in this audience because there's probably quite a number of people here who know more about the topic than me, but it's, it's uh, kind of what's on my mind a lot of the time, so I thought I would talk about it anyway. So I won't give this historical talk about what we did 20 years ago. I'll talk about some things new and hopefully give you a few new ideas about um, maybe some things that, that go on. So let me talk um, just a little bit of introduction. Probably everyone knows about protein kinases, but I'll just tell uh, some real outlines first. Um, so we need the... Okay, so um, obviously protein kinases, they're uh, enzymes, and they, they take a protein and they attach a phosphate to it to make a phosphorylated protein. And as we all know, this acts as a kind of switch. It changes the conformation of the protein, lets it do many things. Um, there is a reverse... I have trouble with this pointer. There's a reverse reaction which is the uh, protein phosphatase that removes the, kind of the phosphate. It's an entirely different group of enzymes, um, and I won't talk about those at all. Okay, so this is, uh, does that work? Ah, much better. Is this the right side? Okay. Anyway, here's a protein kinase. This is actually, this is a protein kinase A. There's an inhibitor here, which is, uh, lies right where the substrate would lie. And this is the part that gets phosphorylated. It's an ATP in here. So what the enzyme does is take the phosphate off the ATP and puts it on right there. Uh, kinases themselves are often regulated by, in fact, this one here has a, gets phosphorylated right to there. Without that phosphate, it's not active. Okay, so this is a, sort of the paradigmatic uh, protein kinase. So one, subunit, basically no other real motifs or anything. Okay, so one thing that's been suggested, I think, that's really interesting about kinases is that they're really phosphocomputers, that they're logic gates. And it's very true that lots and lots of proteins in the cell that are phosphorylated are multiply phosphorylated. So it's easy to imagine that um, a protein that gets phosphorylated, if it has two phosphorylation sites, you can test for an AND or an OR condition by whether they're both phosphorylated, both not phosphorylated, or an OR by one or the other. Okay, so obviously you can construct a computer that way. Many proteins have 10 or 20 even phosphorylation sites. So you could imagine phosphorylated proteins are actually very complicated logic machines. I think that's not true, and, and hopefully I'll get to the end of my talk and be able to show you what I think is actually more true. Okay. Kinases are ubiquitous in eukaryotes. They're found in all eukaryotes. They do very important things. Notably, they're very important regulation of the cell cycle and things like um, the timing of the construction of the mitotic spindle, all kinds of important events in mitosis and meiosis. They also regulate enzymes, very many enzymes, um, for most of the interest in like in uh, the stuff that Chris Sanders was talking about, for instance, um, the people are interested in them as signal transducers. They get a signal from the outside of the cell and they bring it to some effect in the inside of the cell, usually turning on transcription or something. Um, that, I'll argue, is the, the, the later function. Then they also act as signal receivers, and we'll come back to that in a little bit. Okay, so this is the kind of traditional image of what a kinase does. You have a signal, comes into the, the cell surface, gets transmitted across the membrane, and then through a chain of phosphorylation events, each kinase phosphorylating in turn another kinase, this is what they call a cascade, the signal gets transmitted to the nucleus and turns on transcription. So that's what they would call a signal transduction or a kinase cascade. In Eukaryotes, this is all done by one family of proteins, which uh, a lot of people call the EPK family. Um, EPKs are also found in bacteria. They're also found in archaea. What's also found 
in archaea and bacteria are what are called histidine kinases. Histidine kinases are somewhat misnamed because they really should be called aspartate kinases, which is their, what their target is. But anyway, they're also called two-component systems. Uh, in bacteria, there's many more histidine kinases typically than eukaryotic type protein kinases. And the same in archaea, but in fungi, animals, and plants, there's typically many more of the eukaryotic type protein kinases. Uh, nevertheless, if you look at these um, eukaryotic type protein kinases in archaea, and I don't know if I can see this well enough, maybe I can see on this. Um, you can see they have um, no, I can't make that work. Anyway, down over here, this is the, the active site region. They have absolutely common kind of kinase active site region, and they also have in this region just over here, conserved sequences that look just like the same activation loop that you see in PKA. So it's a very ancient structure, probably was present in archaea, probably was present in bacteria, but much less important for them. So there's a, a lot of questions, I think, about where did the, the protein kinases come from. The ones you see in bacteria fall in these other families that if we saw them in most eukaryotes, we would call these atypical protein kinases, so they're the sum of some of the outlying families. And Eugene Koonin has suggested that maybe this ABC1 family is really where the eukaryotic protein kinases came from, but you can read his paper and see if you agree. I think it's, I'd say, far from a, a proven, proven notion, but, uh, but he may be right. Okay, so there's several kinds of protein kinases that you see, and one are what I would call the core protein kinases. They're seen in all eukaryotic organisms. They have no extra domains. They're just a kinase domain. And you can think of things as being paradigmatic for those, like casein kinase 1, MAP kinase. And they're usually involved in very core activities for eukaryotes. Cell cycle, mitosis, meiosis, circadian rhythm. They're very ancient processes. So this is probably what kinases did when they started. They were, they were involved in regulation of cell cycle. And it makes great sense, you know, for, a, for an enzyme that's going to be involved in a sort of checkpoint thing, that uh, you're checkpointed, you're sitting there, you get phosphorylated, now the checkpoint is released and you can go on. So it's a perfect thing for kinases to do. Also manages to tie the cell cycle very neatly to ATP availability and things like that. So the other, it's a crucial tie-in. So the, the kinase cascade, say MAP kinases, this is a MAP kinase cascade in yeast, where you'd go through sterile 11, sterile 7, FUS3, or, so, or here's some uh, other ones of a similar cascade. These would be MAP kinases. They're single domain. They transfer kinase from one to the other. They're scaffolded, we now know. Um, so these are kind of the root activities. What you see in yeast, compared to most eukaryotes, is... Whereas in most other eukaryotes, this uh, receptor would be, a, in fact, a tyrosine kinase receptor. In yeast, that's a histidine kinase. So it's pretty clear that the receptor activity of protein kinases was the very last thing the kinase family moved into doing. There's more complex kinases, and these are the ones I think many people are more familiar with. Um, the AGC family, which is things like protein kinase uh, A, so like the picture I showed, uh, the CAMKs, uh, metal, ion, calcium-dependent kinases, things like that. These are mostly second messenger regulated kinases. So, so they're involved in various second messengers, PKA obviously in cyclic AMP second messaging system. In plants, cyclic AMP is not nearly so important as a second messenger. Calcium is very important and the CAMK family is much bigger in plants and fulfills that same kind of role. They Un, they measure second messenger interactions usually through interaction with a separate subunit that binds whatever the, the messaging molecule is, and then that binds to the kinase and affects its activity. So they become sort of trimeric, the regulatory subunit, the catalytic subunit, and whatever the substrate is. One of the really interesting things, I think difficult to understand things, is very common over evolutionary time that the kinase catalytic subunits become fused 
to their regulatory subunits, even though in most genomes, if you look at them, they're, no, they're located nowhere near each other in the genome. So either this is a very highly selectable thing or there's some, something funny going on, and maybe there's something funny going on. So here's just some examples. This is PKA. It has a separate uh, cyclic AMP binding subunit, which it actually looks just like the cyclic AMP binding domain of bacterial cyclic AMP binding proteins, like cap repressor. Um, other things in the same family, like that protein kinase G, has that regulatory subunit fused. Another, here's another example. This is an example. These are little procyte motifs drawn out on the, on the length of a sequence of a plant uh, calcium dependent protein kinase. Uh, every one of them has one, two, three, four EF hand type motifs. This represents a fusion event of the regulatory subunit of an SNF1 type kinase to its catalytic regulatory subunit to the catalytic subunit happened sometime ancient in the past of plants. Um, this uh, uh, is a large family of enzymes. The uh, other ones still have this other subunit. It's still around, um, but the, uh, this particular family is very important. Um, I won't dwell on this, actually. We did a substantial amount of work looking at, at if you make trees separately from the kinase domain and from the, the uh, calmodulin-like domain, do you get the same tree? And the answer is yes, which means that this whole family arose almost certainly through a single fusion event far back in the history of plants, possibly before the, uh, before the origin of land plants, and it's been propagated ever since. So there's the uh, catalytic domain tree, and there's the uh, Calmodulin domain tree, and, and the, you certainly won't have time to figure out what it's all about. So, but, but if you want to see it later, I can show you. So, okay, so that's the first couple of things. Uh, some of the role cell cycle regulation of enzymes by a phosphorylation signal transduction. What about the, the signal receptor role? Receptor protein protein kinases in mammals are almost all tyrosine protein kinases, which means they phosphorylate tyrosine instead of a serine or a threonine. They have an internal kinase part, a transmembrane domain, single transmembrane domain, and then a whole variety of different kinds of structures on the outside that are all involved in binding to ligands. Typically, they bind them in the, actively as dimers. Uh, and then transmit the signal from that, from that state. In plants, the situation is quite different. Plants use an incredibly similar system that has a protein kinase in the membrane, hooks up to a MAP kinase cascade inside, but it doesn't use a tyrosine protein kinase. It uses a serine threonine protein kinase. Um, fungi and bacteria in the same position use histidine kinase. So this is why I say the, the signal receiving activity was the very last thing to develop. And clearly it developed exactly at that time when the progenitor of the animals in the plants was in the process of diverging. So there's a lot of similarity in the system, but in fact, animals and plants separately recruited a different protein kinase to become the signaling kinase, the, the, the parent of all the signaling kinases. In animals, this was a protein kinase. In plants, it was a different kinase. And we'll come to what that kinase was, I think, in a minute. Um, just a little picture of that. Okay, so how do we find out some of these things? We do, there's a lot of work been done uh, experimentally on kinases in yeast, in mammals, in Drosophila, in C. elegans. But where we've been working is with plants. And the problem is with plants, plants have a large number of protein kinases and nobody has ever done any experiments with them. So how do we figure out how many kinases are there of one type or another type? So this is kind of a, a picture of how we do it. This is a big tree 
This is a tree, if I recall, it has uh, kinases uh, from Arabidopsis and yeast and probably, uh, I want to say human probably in it, but it could just be yeast and Arabidopsis. A big tree, uh, probably about 2,000 leaves in that tree. So we thought that was uh, pretty challenging. But why do we want to make that tree? Okay. So the reason we want to make it is we want to take something we know a lot about. So this is the MAP kinase pathway in yeast. And what we'd like to do is to identify things with some confidence that, so that we could say uh, there's a plant enzyme that's like this one. It has a similar function. At least it's in the same family. And we do this by, I think, pretty common kind of way. The good thing is, and I think the surprising thing, is there are many cases where you can take a deletion mutation of a kinase in yeast and rescue it by putting in the plant enzyme. So there's a whole series of things, and this is the list we came up with about five years ago, the list is much longer now, of plant protein kinases that we know have exactly the same activity as their yeast counterparts. At least they can provide that same activity because they, they substitute for the, in the deletion mutant. So what we can do then is take these as, as positive controls and use them together with the trees we make to see how confident can we be when we assign function. So here's an example. Um, all the kinases here, it's a, uh, I can hardly see this, AT something. Those are all the plant ones, the ones that have other kinds of names, and the ones that are the black triangles. These are the yeast ones. So we, we do the clustering, and we have this whole group of plant ones comes together on this branch with the yeast ones. And so one of these ones is SNF1. That's one of these calcium-dependent sensory kinases. In yeast, it's called SNF1 because it's sucrose non-fermenting if you make a mutation in it. Two of the kinases in this branch, you can take a deletion mutation of a kinase in yeast and rescue it by putting it in plant enzyme. So there's a whole series of things. This is the list we came up with about five years ago, the list is much longer now, of plant protein kinases that we know have exactly the same activity as their yeast counterparts. At least they can provide that same activity because they, they substitute for the, the deletion of mutant. So what we can do then is take these as, as positive controls and use them together with the trees we make to see how confident can we be when we assign function. So here's an example. Um, all the kinases here, let's say, uh, I can hardly see this, AT something, those are all the plant ones, the ones that have other kinds of names, and the ones that are the black triangles, these are the yeast ones. So we, we do the clustering, and we have this whole group of plant ones comes together on this branch with the yeast ones. And so one of these ones is SNF1. That's one of these calcium-dependent sensory kinases. In yeast, it's called SNF1 because it's sucrose non-fermenting if you make a mutation in it. Two of the kinases in this branch, AKIN10, AKIN11, are the two plant kinases, that were, Arabidopsis kinases, that were known. You can put them into the, the uh, yeast and they rescue activity. You can grow on sucrose. So we know those are the same in some sense as us. We can use that to set a kind of a threshold in these uh, graphs. So S and F1, they join at this level here. So we, from looking at all of these, we kind of set thresholds where we think we're... Uh, um, I have two more minutes. All right, so I better go quick. All right, so enough about that. Uh, we've now done this on very big cases. Uh, Arabidopsis, rice, human, Drosophila, C. elegans, yeast. That's a tree with 6,000 branches. The biggest tree we've done has about 10,000 branches. It lets us to systematically see the families quite well. And I will just skip over that. We want to see the detail. Um, so when we looked at the numbers of kinases, 130 in yeast, more in C. elegans, human, I don't know why Drosophila was so low, um, makes sense, right? Humans and Drosophila were more complicated than, than uh, and yeast. What was surprising was when we saw the plants. In plants we see many, many more, thousands, 1,000, 1,600, 2,000 plus. Uh, this bottom one is poplar, the poplar tree, if you don't know that. Okay. So you do this analysis, and this is the kind of thing we find. These are, we recapitulate the known families of kinases around here. These are the tyrosine protein kinases found only in animals. 
these are the plant receptor kinases. And down somewhere, down right down here, this is the only thing in that branch that has animal kinases. Those are the, the animal IRAC kinases, which act just inside the membrane to receive the signal from a tyrosine receptor kinase. So th that's, uh, it's, I think it's very, very strange that plants chose as the progenitor of their whole receptor kinase family, a family that in animals is membrane associated anyway and is involved as the proximal recipient of the signal that, that comes in in the animals. It's very interesting. So obviously the, there was not a clear separation. In spite of everything we know about animal and plant lineages, there was some, even at that stage, they were still very close. All right, so I want to talk about innate immunity. Uh, I want to talk about uh, a lot of the structure in the kinase families is produced by, in plants is produced by gene duplications. Genome-wide duplications are quite common in plants. One of the things you do see is um, whole families get elaborated. So this is a family. The, uh, the green ones are, are Arabidopsis. The ones that are white, these are from rice. So this is a, a big cluster that comes out. And you can see that the, the family in Arabidopsis, which only has about 20 things in it, has expanded enormously to around 80 or 90 things in rice. This is quite common. A lot of times you see those things will then be in tandem of arrays on the chromosome. It's all very interesting. Okay. Whole unique families. All right, so let me go quickly into this. So if we start from this, a simple, this is a very simple thing. It's easy for us to understand, or as John Devereaux would say, this is easy for us to grok. I don't know if anyone knows John, but the red stranger in a strange land. But how do you get from that to this? How, what's the evolutionary process that lets you build such a complicated system? Let me just make you a little model quickly in the few minutes I have left. So here's a cartoon of a cascade, a receptor, a kinase cascade. So you can add new things to that by duplication and divergence of function. So if we duplicate the receptor, we get something like this, multiple things going into a kinase cascade. It's very easy to see why there would be some selective advantage for those receptor kinases to have some specialization in what function of uh, ligand they're receiving the signal from. You can also have mutations of any of these things in the tree. And, and I, if I duplicate any one of these, when I duplicate it, it'll still get phosphorylated by the same parent and it'll phosphorylate the same child. So I'm just like creating a, 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 a parallel circuit. And if you put those together, you can get something pretty complicated. And uh, this is uh, pretty much what people see when they look at cells. And there's an example of exactly something like that I took out of a paper on some plant, plant kinases. So different signals coming in and going through. These are actually not kinases. Those are the, the uh, receptor second messenger subunits. But it looks very much like that same diagram. But the puzzling thing is... When you start to look at these things over, over a wide range of things, so this is a little diagram, stresses and signals around the outside, and then each layer as you go in is part of the map kinase cascade. And they've tried to arrange this so that the, to show the information that overlaps between these things. So things that activate the stress system also activate inflammation or uh, stress and osmotic shock and inflammation. So, and people usually talk about this as crosstalk. So I talk about this as if it's noise in the system, like right? it's a flaw in the system, that the, the signal shouldn't be overlapping. But let's go back to this picture. Let me redraw this. Let me redraw it like that. So when I duplicate these internal kinases, and they have exactly the same links as their, part, their, their siblings, if you will, this is a kind of diagram. And some people in this room should recognize this di diagram. At least Soren should recognize this diagram. So if you have this kind of a structure, and then you start to get random mutation, so each of these arrows you can think of as the strength of the phosphorylation in that layer. Over time, you get some random divergence. And now you actually have something. This is selectable. The output of this little machine as a whole is selectable. Because what we've done is we've built a neural net. This is precisely a neural net, and this is probably why 
neural nets are such a good technology for predicting some of the things that cells do. What are neural nets good for? Neural nets are good for learning very complex, nonlinear responses to multiple stimuli where the border between them is very rough and convoluted. It's exactly what you want to do if you're a plant sitting in a field and you have bugs chewing on you and it's freezing and the rain is coming down and then the sun is coming out. You have to respond to all these things simultaneously and, and that's, that's why they're there. And if you don't believe me that that's what animals and plants both have built, look at that. Looks like a neural net to me. All right, so I think that's, uh, that's all I had. My time is out. This is a lot of people who worked for me. Of course, up to a few years ago, I was in San Diego. This is my old group at San Diego. This is my new group at Purdue. And then lots of coworkers, mostly in the area of plant genomics over the years. All right, so that's all. Okay, so we are still ahead of schedule, so there is time for just one or two questions before we take the bus. So, uh, at the back, there's a microphone. Okay. Is there a kinase support vector machine? Um, I can, a kinase for, I couldn't hear. I think the question is, is, your, is there a support vector machine, is that correct? Is it, does there exist a kinase support vector machine? Can you repeat that? Oh, uh, sorry, it's a lame joke. No, but there could be. I don't know. I have to think about that one. I mean, it's maybe true that, in fact, if you have such a thing, that, in fact, the boundary condition, just as in a support vector machine, is the most important thing to get exactly right. And I. Or difficult decisions. This is a worth looking for, I think. I think, I think I'll look for this. Okay, so there appear to be no more questions, so it just remains to thank once again the speaker, Michael.